October 13th, uh, 2015, Carolina County Board of Supervisors meeting to order. Uh, board members present, Mr. Floyd Thomas, representing the Mattapanai District. Mr. Jeff Black, representing the Western Carolina District. Mr. Reggie Underwood, representing the Reedy Church District. Uh, Mr. Wayne Akers, representing the Madison District. Mr. Jeff Seeley representing the Bowling Green District, and I'm Calvin Taylor. I represent the Port Royal District. And at this time, if I could impose on you, Mr. Buck, would you come and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Yes, I want to do the invocation first. Oh, I'm sorry. We got to do the invitation, invocation first and then okay. the pledge. Okay. Uh, okay. Mr. Akers, I believe uh, it's your turn. Oh, Oh, is it you, sir? I now did. Oh, okay. okay. Ms. Akers. Let us stand, please. Our loving and wonderful God, as we come into this place this evening, as a board to conduct the business of this county, we ask for your divine leading uh, in helping us to make the decisions that we need to make. That's going to be the betterment of Caroline County and for the residents that we represent. Lord, we thank you for loving us, and we thank you for blessing us as individuals and as a county. And we just ask that you continue to guide, direct, and be with us as we go through our daily lives. Again, we thank you for just loving us and undergirding us with your love. What is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay. Uh, do we have any amendments to the agenda? Uh, Mr. Chairman, no, we do not. Okay. Any board members? If not, the agenda will stand approved as presented. Uh, opening board comments. Mr. Thomas, do you have any? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I have a couple of uh, short ones. Uh, just want to say thank you. Uh, first, to Chief Loftus, the residents of Belmont are working to find volunteers uh, for fire and rescue in that area, and they've been working with the chief to talk about training, so I think that's going to be a good thing. Uh, hopefully, they'll have at least 10 volunteers who would like to start a Carmel Church fire station in the near future. Uh, and, and we'll keep working on that. The other one, or, or the second one, Mr. Chairman, is, as you know, the board voted to uh, help Germana come to uh, the county. They are going to be in the Belmont Professional Building. I have been in contact with a uh, former constituent who now lives in Spotsylvania who wants to create a masonry class and se several other trade classes to go in there. So I put him in touch with the school board. I believe he was at the school board yesterday. I don't think there's any uh, county involvement, but I just wanted the board to know that even before the building is finished, we have people that are trying to do classes there, and uh, I think that's going to be a great thing. And the last one, Mr. Chairman, uh, the high school construction is going along wonderfully, but none of us uh, ever thought of the impact that was going to have on the polling place, because the Mount Panay District, the entire district uses the high school gym. And if you've been by there lately, you notice that the high school gym parking lot is basically gone. Um, and after further review, most of the lights inside the parking area are also gone. So I met with Mr. Whiteman, uh, the electoral board, and school officials. And I believe, again, he asked uh, Chief Loftus for some help. So we're going to uh, try to use the fire and rescue lighting to keep a safe environment. And because most of the parking is gone, they'll be probably about a quarter mile to a half a mile away from the pole. I think he's got some uh, golf carts we're going to shuttle the handicap to the polling place, too. So I appreciate that in advance, gentlemen, and wanted to make sure the citizens have a safe voting experience. That's it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Mr. Black? Not at this time, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Mr. Underwood? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Just two. I um, want to certainly thank the our um, professional staff, the Sheriff's Office, uh, EMS Rescue, for helping us with the 
uh, UCI bike race that went through uh, the Reedy Church District. Certainly, uh, it was an event that um, was was a national event, and I think uh, we, we got some exposure. Also, want to uh, say thank you to Sheriff Lippa and his staff. On last um, Saturday, he had a community relations day where he and his um, staff came out and got to meet some of the residents of the community, played a uh, little basketball, threw football around. But just the first steps in being proactive in terms of community policing. So I certainly wanted to say thank you to the sheriff for, for that, and we look forward to doing uh, activities again as a group to build our relationships in our county with our citizens so we can be proactive. So that's all, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Akers. Mr. Chairman, I do. Um, on the 22nd of October at 7 o'clock, I have a constituent meeting at uh, in Lady Smith Village at the library uh, at Lady Smith Village. Uh, we had one last night in uh, Lake Caroline. It was well attended. Uh, and basically what I've done is just to explain what's going on and to uh, have some insight as to how Walmart and, uh, is going to impact them the county and certainly impact the area of, of the Ladysmith. And then on the 29th of October, I will be in uh, Pendleton subdivision at 6 o'clock uh, with the same group of uh, staff. Just want to let that be known. Thank you, Mr. Akers. Uh, Mr. Seeley? Just want to remind everybody that the Harvest Festival is this Saturday. Uh, the weather looks like it's going to be on the cool side, which is always good for Harvest Festival. Looking forward to seeing all kinds of folks there. Thank you. And I just have a couple of, um, would like to remind board members that the registrar and the board of electors are visiting the polling places. Uh, they were at the Woodford precinct this morning. Uh, so if you would like to be there when they schedule the visit, you could certainly check with the registrar, or, or, or I suspect the registrar will probably let you know. Uh, but that's something you might want to keep in mind, uh, is they are visiting the polling places. And if you have concerns or issues, you could certainly be there. If you could be there with them, you may be able to address any issues that you may have. Uh, and the only other one um, I would, would uh, uh, talk about is uh, several weeks ago, we honored uh, Reverend Jackson for his um, work in the community and his leadership. And uh, I'm sorry to say he passed away on last week. And he is being funeralized this Saturday at 2 p.m. So I'm glad that the board had the opportunity to recognize him uh, in the great things and the uh, impact that he has had on the community and on the county. And I send our condolences to his family. Uh, having said that, that takes us to uh, presentations and reports. Uh, our first presentation is the recognition of Andrew Buck for Carlisle High School Memorial Garden Project. Uh, Mr. Buck, you may come forward. Uh, and while he's coming, I'm going to read his resolution such that we will all benefit from uh, what's been uh, written here. And it says, a resolution congratulating Andrew Buck for the completion of his memorial garden at Carlisle High School. Whereas Andrew Buck, a Carlisle High School junior and member of the Boy Scout Troop 173 in Bowling Green, recently held a dedication ceremony for a memorial garden he completed at Carlisle High School. And whereas the garden, which consists of benches, ringing a semicircle pathway lined with flowers and dogwood and cherry trees with a weeping willow at the center, was conceived, designed, and constructed by Mr. Buck with the help of family, friends, and his Boy Scout troop. And whereas Mr. Buck originally envisioned the garden as a way to honor the memory of one of his best friends and then realized that it could offer visitors a place to contemplate and reminisce about loved ones and friends who have passed away. And whereas Mr. Buck's project is a gift to the community and a truly impressive example of what the youth of Caroline County are capable of accomplishing. 
Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Carlisle County Board of Supervisors hereby congratulates and commends Andrew Buck for a job well done and extends its best wishes for continued success in the future. It's adopted this 13th day of October 2015 and it's signed by Charles M. Colley, Jr., Clerk of the Board, and Calvin B. Taylor, Chairman. Appreciate what you've done, and uh, we're very proud of you. Other board members would like to kind of shake hands with you as well. Uh, if, you, uh, if there's a family member from Mr. Buck that's here, you're welcome to come forward if you like. Again, congratulations to Mr. Buck, and we appreciate all the hard work that he did. Um, our second presentation is the adoption, the adoption of a resolution designating October 21st through 31st, 2015 as Red Ribbon Week in Caroline County. And it says a resolution declaring October 21st through 31, 2015 Red Ribbon Week in Carlisle County and honoring the Young Marines program. Whereas the Young Marines is a drug demand reduction program sponsored by the Marine Corps League membership is for children ages 8 to 18 or through completion of high school. And whereas the Young Marines models its program after Marine Corps values of honor courage and commitment by focusing on teaching youth to live a drug-free lifestyle and teaching ideas such as leadership, teamwork, and disciple. I'm sorry, and discipline. As whereas the local branch of the Young Marines is named after Lance Corporal Caleb John Powers, a Marine from Fredericksburg who participated in the program and was killed in action in Iraq. And whereas the Lance Corporal Caleb John Powers, young Marines participate in, a, in and promote the National Red Ribbon Campaign. And whereas each year the young Marines sponsor a National Red Ribbon Week that gives the individual the opportunity to wear a red ribbon signifying their opposition to illegal drug use. And whereas the National Red Ribbon Campaign will be celebrated in every community in America during Red Ribbon Week, October 25th through the 31st, and whereas business, government, parents, law enforcement, media, medical institutions, religious institutions, schools, senior citizens, service organizations, and youth will demonstrate their commitment to healthy, drug-free lifestyles by wearing and displaying red ribbons during this week-long campaign. And now, therefore, be it resolved 
that the Carolina County Board of Supervisors hereby proclaims October 25th through 31st, 2015 as Red Ribbon Week in Carolina County. And be it therefore resolved that the board does hereby recognize and commend the Lance Corporal Caleb John Powers Young Marines and its commitment to live a drug-free life and participation in Red Ribbon Week. It's adopted the 13th day of October, 2015. It's signed by Charles M. Collier, Jr., Clerk of the Board, and Calvin B. Taylor, Chairman. Thank you. Is this? Okay. If you would want to come forward at this time uh, so that we can present this. Again, on behalf of the Carlisle County Citizens and the Carlisle County Board of Supervisors, I would present this resolution to the both of you and wish you much happiness and success. Okay? Thank you. And the other board members, so we need to take this. Okay, our next agenda item is report from Rappahannock Goodwill Industries. Thank you for the time on the agenda tonight. I'm Woody Van Valkenberg. I've appeared before the Council of the Board of Supervisors several times over several generations of Boards of Supervisors. I'm here tonight just to say thank you because I am retiring after 35 years at Rappahannock Goodwill Industries. I want to thank you and the citizens of the uh, Caroline County for their, your support of uh, Rappahannock and Goodwill Industries. I also plan to introduce and allow us to say a few words, my successor. So Rappahannock Goodwill Industries has been working here in the community for quite some time. Caroline County, while we don't have too many operations, is always on our, our, in our sites for uh, building a store or providing job help centers or any of those activities that happen with our social enterprise. You do know, I've heard tonight from uh, some, uh, some fine people about our trailers that collect the donations. What you might not know is those donations go through the stores. We probably know that. The profits of those stores go into our social enterprise of providing such programs as, as job help centers, places where people can go for free to help them learn how to use the internet for job seeking, to learn interviewing skills, to get their resumes in order, in short, to get on with the business of work. Rappahannock Goodwill Industries also provides employment for quite a few people who otherwise can't find employment in mainstream, in the mainstream world. Primarily those folks are people with significant disabilities. Caroline County goes back years prior to my time with Rappahannock Goodwill, which if you do the math is 1980. Uh, in, the, in the 70s, Rappahannock Goodwill, our predecessor organization, Rappahannock Rehabilitation Facility, was supported by Caroline County. And when I say support, again, it's through the various uh, programs that we offer. It has never been, to my knowledge, through asking for any kind of budget allocation. We don't do that. Our social enterprise is the economic fuel to run Rappahannock Goodwill Industries. So I am retiring after 35 years. And uh, again, want to thank all the county administrations, the supervisors, and the Caroline County people for the support of Goodwill. One person I really want to thank, particularly with her work of late, is your own tourism manager, Kathy Beard, who is my boss. 
Kathy has been a longtime member of the Board of Directors of Rappahannock Goodwill Industries and has served in the role of the chairman. And during that time, we went through succession planning, search, and chose my successor, and Kathy ran that well. You might want to find, unless she doesn't want me to say, find another position in the county, but Kathy is here. You all know Kathy. She has been wonderful for our board of directors. So I want to introduce Donnie Tolson. He's our current chief financial officer. He will be succeeding me as president and chief executive on January 1st. Uh, personally, I couldn't be more pleased with Donnie taking this position. I've known Donnie for over 25 years. He's a colleague, he's a mentor, and he's a friend. I believe that Rap and Goodwill Industries will continue along the path that it has in growing and serving even more people with barriers to employment. Donnie has a 27-year career with Goodwill Industries International, and then he took what he refers to now an extended sabbatical. For about seven years, he was retired, and then I found that the goodwill burn hadn't really gone out. And I found him sitting on his porch in Front Royal, Virginia, and brought him. He said he'd give us two years. It's five years, and he's now taking on the president and CEO role. So I'd like Donnie to have a, a few minutes to paint a picture of what he sees as a future for goodwill. Thank you very much again for the support you've good, given to the company and to me personally. Thank, Thank you, sir. And I'll be very brief. Uh, I want to thank each of you uh, supervisors for your public service. You know, communities don't work without the support of the governance function. And we particularly on the drive-in appreciated all the fine signs that uh, Supervisor Seeley had out there. And judging from the quality, I'm sure you'll do quite well. Um, so I look forward to working with you, with the county administration, with the Economic Development Authority, and others as uh, Rappahannock Goodwill Industries helps you uh, build a community and series of communities together. You know, I'm, I'm going to remark just very briefly that our founder, 1902, said, be dissatisfied with your work until every handicapped and unfortunate person achieved their fullest usefulness and enjoyed a maximum of abundant living. And he said that a long, long time ago, about the time Woody started his goodwill career. Uh, and that is what we believe one job at a time. We're in the workforce development business, one job at a time, regardless of the barrier, chronic poverty, illiteracy, criminal history, disability, uh, what have you. Um, now, you guys are hitting some home runs on the economic development front, and that's well known throughout the region. And so I think it's safe to say from that perspective, and we would appreciate being at that table when those discussions are had, uh, Rap Hand and Goodwill Industry, certainly uh, in the next five years, I can see both a thrift store presence and a job help center uh, in one or more of these communities in Caroline County. And I could go on and on and on, but I tell you, the best spokesperson for what Rap Hand and Goodwill Industries does, and indeed all Goodwill Industries, are, is one of our many successes. So, uh, with a little help from Joey here, we're going to try and if you, 90 seconds, crane your necks in that direction. We might have sound. We thought we had sound. Unemployment, you know, it was like living on the streets is there's no fun, you know what I mean? After I met my friend, that's when things. I'm originally from Maryland, and I, and I came down with my friend of mine. Her family's down here. So, uh, you know, it, it was kind of rough in Maryland for me, so it, I figured it changed the situation. It was going to better my life and everything. Homelessness, you know, divorce, unemployment, you know, it was like living on the streets is, is no fun, you know what I mean? After I met my friend, that's when things really started spiraling up for me. I, I looked at reality aspect and said, I can get back. I met Brian at the Job Health Center. I learned my computer skills and just got my willpower back. It's a great, it's a great opportunity. If you really want to get yourself together, these people are there for you. I got my own website now. I'm online. I'm cool. I'm making it happen. The Will Industry, the Good Will Job Center program is there to help you. And I love it. I love it what they did for me. They gave me the incentive, the uplifting power to be able to just, hey man, get back on your two feet. Go be a man. Go do what you got to do. Get your life back in order. And if I can do it, anybody can do it, man. It's easy. Just set your mind to it. 
Thank you. And I have a handout. I'm not sure how to get it to you. I, was, I flunked the paper airplanes uh, class. So. Oh. And uh, just thank you, Rep. Hannah Goodwill Industry. Thank you. And I personally look forward to visiting with you folks in the future. Thank you. Uh, I would just like to say on behalf of the board that we very much appreciate uh, Woody as, as well as David for uh, the work that you all have done and for the Goodwill uh, industries and how they impact the community. Uh, we recognize the importance of that group and we certainly recognize the importance of you, Woody, in the 35 years that you've uh, been with Goodwill and the accomplishments that you've been able to make during that time and the community impact that has been made as a result of what uh, Goodwill is doing. And, and certainly we like to thank our economic development uh, person as well uh, for, for your input and for, for what you've done to uh, help make this a, a successful uh, endeavor. And again, we just say thank you. Okay, that takes us to uh, our final report. Um, we have um, our director from the Rappahannock Council Against Sexual Assault. Um, they have um, or they work with Carolina County and certainly other jurisdictions as well. Uh, but they've been very successful within the county and there are some programs that uh, they've initiated and I just thought it would be good for the board to hear uh, the impact that this group is having in the county. So without uh, any more or talk, I'll turn it over to Mark and you may. Thank you, Chairman Taylor. My name is Mark Blackwell and I'm the Executive Director of the Rappahannock Council Against Sexual Assault. And we provide services to sexual assault victims in Planning District 16, of which Caroline County is a um, part of. And um, I'm just going to tell, we want to tell you some a real exciting partnership that we've had some of, the, some of the stuff that we've been doing with the Caroline County Public School Systems. Just a little bit of information about, about our agency. Um, next year, we will celebrate 30 years in operation. We were founded back in 1986 as a rape crisis center. Um, we are governed by a board of directors. Of, we're a 5013C, um, of which I'm proud to say that Chairman Taylor is a member of our board of directors. Um, we have an operating budget of about $365,000 a year. Um, about $235,000 of that comes from the, um, it's a pass down through a block grants that come through the federal government to the Department of Criminal Justice Services, basically through different um, crime victims, um, uh, victims of crime um, uh, uh, um, allocations of funds. Um, about $40,000, well, $40,000 of our budget comes from uh, the localities in PD-16. Uh, $500 of that comes from, from Caroline County. Um, again, I want to get to the fun stuff that we're doing with the county, but just, a, just an idea of what we do do for, for, um, for the uh, victims in our area. Um, we have a hotline service that, that operates 24-7 for um, anybody that's in crisis that needs to call, that we can deal with crisis situations, or just make a referral um, to, a, to a, um, a local agency if that's necessary. Hospital accompaniment is where we send a volunteer or a staff member to the hospital to, uh, to accompany somebody that is the victim of sexual assault. Um, there's been a lot in the news and in the General Assembly about this whole process and the, um, the, the uh, collection of um, forensic Date, um, it, um, uh, materials and that type of stuff, and we're, we're there for that process. The case management program is helps um, people that are in uh, the recovery phase of their of their trauma to, to work through and, and connect with other services in the community to make them whole again. And then we have a we have a counseling program that provides uh, trauma um, based services to them again to help them in their recovery process. Um, the outreach and prevention is what David Schaefer, who is their um, community coordinator, does, and I'm going to let him go into that for you, please. Yeah, so uh, for our outreach program, uh, what we do is uh, awareness activities in the community. Uh, earlier in the year, we were actually at the Caroline uh, Family Fair at Caroline Middle School uh, doing presentations on teen dating violence, 
uh, and healthy relationships. We are going to be uh, at the Harvest Festival uh, at the end of the week, uh, and we participate in other awareness activities in Planning District 16, um, including uh, vigils on uh, community campuses, uh, as well as Germana, um, and uh, social media out, uh, outreach and activities like that. Um, prevention, uh, which is uh, what we try to uh, uh, put a lot of effort behind in our communities, because ultimately our goal is to no longer need our cost of services. Um, so we do presentations, uh, as we are going to mention, uh, Caroline Middle School. Uh, we do presentations on UM, uh, UMW's campus, Germana. Uh, I do uh, frequent presentations with the Rappahannock Juvenile Center, as well as Chaplin Youth Center uh, in Fredericksburg. Uh, and we also participate uh, in the Office on Youth's My Life program uh, in King George Middle School. So uh, in Caroline, uh, we talked to sixth graders, uh, the entire sixth grade class, uh, as well as uh, towards the end, uh, seventh grade class, we came in um, following the, uh, the great program was no longer uh, going to be facilitated as a result of an unfortunate accident to the uh, facilitator. Uh, but we talked to sixth graders um, uh, about five sessions apiece. Uh, at the beginning of each, uh, we did a pretest, and following, we did a post test uh, to sort of measure the successes and what students were learning and what they, uh, what they needed to learn, uh, what they already knew. 93% uh, responded yes or probably yes on our post test, uh, compared to 42% on the pretest. When asked, does this describe a healthy relationship? Quote, your friend pressures you to act a certain way. It represents an increase of 51%. Um, when asked, is this a warning sign? Your friend makes excuses when they are rude to you or others. Students reported 14% yes and probably yes on the pretest, while 89% gave positive response in our post-test. Uh, we also observed an increase in the number of students reporting that they knew how to reach out to somebody. Um, so that would be 71 to 93 percent. Um, those two f uh, first questions are our primary targets. Uh, we wanted to make sure that students were not only uh, recognizing uh, unhealthy, uh, but also healthy uh, behaviors and relationships, or what we would call red flags or green flags. Um, and we also wanted to make sure that students knew who to talk to. Um, I have previously uh, facilitated, and our cost has previously facilitated similar presentations to other communities in the past. And what we notice is that there's a dramatic increase in what students are being able to recognize. So the great, the great work that is already being done with regards to bullying, uh, as well as other bi violence prevention efforts in the community and schools uh, are being uh, recognized in these uh, pre-tests and post-tests as well as the work that our cost is doing. And if you all have any questions for uh, us tonight uh, or in the future, we'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted the board to uh, kind of be aware of, of, of the input that this group has within our county. Uh, I'm sure the sheriff could attest to the fact that, you know, how important training our young people is. Uh, if we can meet them uh, at early ages and begin to deal with some of the issues that they have, then hopefully we can help to put an end to some of the tragic uh, things that go on. Just this afternoon, uh, Interstate 95 was closed down uh, between Massaponics and uh, I think Route 3 because someone jumped off the bridge. And more and more we are hearing about issues uh, of, of tragedy. And while I don't know that it's our job necessarily to do that, but I think it's the job of the country to do what we can to try and head off some of the uh, terrible things that are going on and send it through this group. And, and many, many other groups, uh, training, learning to identify certain issues and behaviors, and having some type of program in place to try to address it is probably the only way we're going to stop it. So basically, that's, that's why they're here. Uh, if other board members, do you have questions or comments? If so, you could 
uh, speak at this time. I just had a question about something Mr. Blackwell referenced. Sure. Um, Mr. Blackwell, you referenced the, um, during your presentation the news story about test kits that, that weren't being processed. Are you involved in that, or is that purely state law enforcement? Um, that would most likely be uh, state law enforcement. We try to uh, maintain our focuses on the victims and supporting the victims. Um, so we would work with law enforcement as well as Commonwealth Attorney's Office um, when it comes to specific cases, but we're not actually involved in sort of the pushing of um, actually testing these, uh, these kids. Okay, so that's not something that the, the county helps fund you, um, and, and in this case, since you're not doing that, it's all on the state, and, and we need to be more active on the state level. Yeah, yeah. And as far as I, as far as uh, I'm aware, um, the uh, the state uh, and the communities, as well as the rest of the country, are really uh, beginning to take uh, some great leaps when it comes to uh, testing these kits and um, addressing sexual and intimate partner violence. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, Mr. Black, did you have Hey, Mr. Underwood, thank you. Mr. Akers, yeah. Mr. Seely, and I don't have any more. Again, thank you for what you do, and we very much appreciate your presentation. Okay, that takes us to appointments. Uh, Recreation Advisory Committee at Large member. I don't know if that's, um, we have a person for that. What we can do is uh, we can leave it on the agenda for next time. And if a board member has someone that they would like to uh, see in that role or suggest, we can uh, do it at our next meeting. OK? Uh, the Economic Development Authority at large member is presently being filled by uh, Mr. Fulop, or Reverend Fulop Atkins, and he has um, um, said that he would be willing to serve in that capacity if the board so desires. So we can entertain a motion at this time to fill that um, appointment. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that Mr. Philip Atkins um, remain the at-large member at, of the Economic Development Authority. Second. Okay, it's been moved in proper second that Mr. Philip Atkins would remain the at-large member. Um, Saving the Economic Development Authority. All in favor, let it be known by saying aye. 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 All opposed, motion carries unanimously. That takes us to the consent agenda, items A through G. Are there any items on the consent agenda that any board member would like to question or pull? If not, we can entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented, items A through G. Question, Mr. Chairman? Yes. <clears throat> And, and, and just to make sure, I, um, on item G, which is the autism conference, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure we're going to approve that. The question is, they still pay the custodial fee, right? Whenever, even when we waive the fees, the custodial fee is still charged? You're saying no to the custodial fee? Okay. You can just, I mean, that's fine. You can shake your head. No, that's fine. Okay. 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 If not, we, we can uh, approve the agenda as presented, A through G. So, so moved. Chairman. Yep. So moved. We make a motion. Yeah, I'll, I'll make a motion. motion. We need a motion first. I'd like to make a motion that we approve the consent agenda A through G. Second. It's been moved and properly second that we um, approve the consent agenda as presented, items A through G. All in favor, let it be known by saying aye. 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 All opposed, motion carries. Okay. Um, let me see. Are there? Uh, well, we can't do any public hearings, but you could do eight. Okay, approval of change order number two for Motorola Public Service uh, Radio Project. We can look at that one. Agenda item eight. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, members of the board, um, it, it, when uh, Deputy Chief Garnett gave the update uh, a couple of meetings ago, a question came up about full foliage for the, the testing, which we actually have started this week, and obviously we're not at full foliage at this time of year. And so we, 
working with uh, Dave Muniz from Federal Engineering and Motorola, got them to agree that any grids that come back between one and two bit error rate, with two would be the, the worst you could have. Anything more than two, it's failing. So that would be um, the marginal areas would be between one and two bit error rate, that they would agree to come back at no charge when the leaves have come back out on in the in you know late spring or you know to test any of the grids and it's three thousand some grids that they have to test and so um, that way we can then have uh, operation the system operational and get use of the system in December hopefully um, we'll we'll go on and pay them the milestones for the test that they're doing now and their final uh, payment we'll hold back. Uh, Five percent, which will be one hundred twenty-five thousand um, dollars, which will settle up after they do the retest. And right now, we don't know how many grids that'll be, and we'll have uh, federal look at the data to make sure that you know they're testing what they're supposed to be. So we thought that was a workable solution for both parties. Otherwise, we just wouldn't have had any use of the system through the whole winter. So really, I don't know that we are in a position we can't do without the service. And my understanding is they will come back if. If there is an issue, yes. Uh, okay. I guess my question is not the, bear, the the ones that actually fail one or two bits, but do you get a pass rate in areas that might be marginal because there aren't any? The leaf leaf coverage is lower. I just found it interesting that there's there's no accepted standards for full foliage. Correct. I, I found that an interesting statement since we've been talking about that for six months. Well, the best we could garner from Foliage makes obviously a difference, but it's not like no foliage versus full foliage, where you right. would definitely see things that are much better that will be much worse with the leaves. So that we're sort of at, who knows, 50% or 60%, whatever we're at. Everybody, and Dave Muniz, was, this was his suggested fix uh, from federal to be able to get the, off of dead center of not being able to use the system the whole winter that this would provide the best. And, and the report I'm getting back, pretty much everything is testing out at near about 100% of what they've done so far. So we're not really finding really any bad spots yet. And I this is I on road coverage. So yeah, deep right. in the woods it may make a difference, but this is on road coverage anyway. I guess I have a question for Major Mosier. Will we know this winter, will you be able to tell us where there are issues in radio coverage yes can we keep track of those throughout the winter so that in the spring we can come back and look at those areas that is part of the plan yes sir because one of the things that's even more maybe more detrimental is wet limbs in the winter time because they're more like antennas than they are blocking coverage you know foliage is blocking coverage 700 megahertz doesn't there are some, some minor problems, but wet limbs could actually be for us one of our bigger problems. I just like to keep track of the dead spaces. And that's going to be part of our warranty anyhow. If we have any problem areas throughout the county, we'll constantly keep track of that as well. Will we be using boosters in the cars? Since I know some of the trunks actually have boosters, will we be using those all the time or just when you need them? No. Uh, the only boosters that we'll have will be in the buildings for in-building in coverage. So nothing in the trunks? Not required. Okay. Okay? Okay, Good. thank you. Uh -huh. can I question? Other questions? Can, can you follow up on that, uh, Major? You said the only boosters you'll have are in buildings. For in building coverage, that's correct. So if there's an incident in this building, you would actually bring a booster in with you? No. Uh, it's actually <clears throat> a device that will be purchased in some of the uh, proffers that we've made on some of the most recent the sheriff has asked for that to be put into like the Walmart building so that the coverage inside Walmart will That's, be better. Okay. And uh, they run, I don't remember what they priced them out, 45000 a piece or something they're, like they're that. They're in the 40000 range. The chief might know better on the price on that. I'd just like to add one thing. And part of our contract is some coverage uh, on identified buildings, schools being one of those that we identified right. in the contract that Motorola needs to test inside. If it comes below those decibel levels, they need to put an in-building solution in that. They will provide at no additional cost. That is correct. On the okay. buildings that were identified in the contract. Not all buildings, but right. specific ones we knew we had to have coverage in, schools being 
the predominant one we look for. There's 11 buildings in question. Okay. Right. And, and what we're saying now as a policy in the future, when there are large buildings or large developments, we will ask them to provide a booster as part of their proffer. We, well, if they're doing Voluntary rezoning, proffers, yeah. if they're rezoning, we right. will we will do that. But what we would like to do, and Mr. Emerson has helped us with that, is in a month or so bring you language that we can put in our local ordinance, so that it, if the property is not being rezoned, that we can still get that in-building coverage. For example, what we wanted something to say is, if the building is over 30,000 square feet, the coverage inside the building must be the same as it is outside the building. If it is not, then an in-building solution needs to be provided by that built owner of the building. By, by the owner. New okay. construction only uh, right. moving forward. Right. But we want a real solution that covers both those buildings that are rezoned and those that are not being rezoned. If someone's building a 30,000 square foot warehouse on a property that is zoned for that, we would not have the leverage if we don't go a different route politically. Right. So a couple okay. months we should have that wording to you. All right, and that's, a, that's been a key thing that the, the sheriff and you have said before is in building there sometimes when you don't have the proper reception. That's correct. Okay, my last question is, is the, we're withholding 122000 and change, um, whatever that number was, 122739 Is that realistically an, um, enough to rectify any problems we determine? Or we're really saying Motorola is going to fix every place that the uh, reception is not good in the spring or summer when we have full foliage. This is the way the contract was set up. They're supposed to do this coverage right. test. It's supposed to pass. Right. Say it had been done in the summer, then we would work toward the the, the cutover date. Right. And then a 30-day burn-in. Then we have to pay them that final payment in full. So anyhow. Right. Anyhow. What the, all this does is it adds this language that they will come back and retest a, an unknown amount of blocks, which they pay a contractor or a subcontractor yeah. to come do with their computers and cars and stuff, that type of thing. So it, we will be identifying during the 30-day burn-in everything we can identify that's not working to what we would think the contract called for, and we would have this layered of these areas that we know are marginal they're going to retest so I, I think that's pretty much enough money to cover all of all of that that we would need that's kind of what i thought i just wanted to hear you say it and and the reality is we you know the best laid plans of mice and men we had intended to, this to be done in the summer but because we didn't get permission from the state police through general services correct at the state level we're now kind of behind the eight ball but luckily, the vendor is going to work with us, so we'll be able to be up and running in December. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Other questions? If not, a motion is in order. So moved, Mr. Chairman, that we uh, accept this zero-cost change order. Second. The moved and proper second that we would approve change order number two for Motorola Public Safety. Radio project as presented. All in favor, let it be known by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, motion carries unanimously. Uh, can we do number nine? Is that, do we have time enough to do that? Okay, uh, agenda item number nine, possible adoption of um, VA USBC property maintenance code to address code violations at county motel. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, you have before you uh, a packet outlining a number of issues that staff has uh, identified uh, at one or more of the motels in the Carmel Church area. Currently, we are somewhat limited in terms of our ability to uh, address uh, these issues. And what you have before you is a request from staff for the board to consider a limited adoption of the uh, of a specific section of the Virginia Uniform Statewide Building Code uh, as it relates to uh, property maintenance of certain types of residential structures. You have the 
issues that have been identified you have the supporting documentation from the virginia uniform statewide building code and you also have a schematic which outlines a potential limited area and within the the carmel church growth area for consideration of adoption of an ordinance specific to these areas the board's aware that we've had a number of complaints at these facilities over the years those complaints have increased to the point that we have a i think a legitimate concern about health and safety issues and we get these complaints from not only within our department or within building inspections but from other departments and agencies as well and collectively we have identified this as as the one step and and i would argue the first and most important step in terms of addressing these issues mr whiteman has assembled much of the documentation that is included in your presentation and is here to answer any specific questions related to the the code the authority uh... and the the details of how it would work but again the boundary that you have in there is a very limited uh... boundary uh... designed to address existing or potential locations for uh... uh... motels in the carmel church area uh... yeah the question that i had just as i was looking through here i was under the impression that if a building is unclean or dangerous or is has the potential for a person to be sick or is the health department not uh... an avenue to address these issues um you know i'm not saying i'm not that we don't need property maintenance but you know where does the health department fall in in line with this these kinds of situations yes sir um... in the report there some of those are health department inspections and we actually did a joint inspection where those photographs are of the studio cities it if there is a a potential for a a health concern they do have what they call a motel inspection program and how they execute that uh, i'm not really sure i've never known them to go forward with any enforcement nor when we did the joint inspection did they let me know once we got done and then a couple days later they said hey kevin here's our report so i i don't know what action they do take but by the uniform statewide building code any residential unit that we get a complaint on we being the building department it gives me the authority to go and specifically address the life safety issue or the building code item that is in the complaint but it doesn't give me the jurisdiction to do further inspections of the facility an example I may get a complaint, a perfect example. I had a firefighter out of Pennsylvania who was traveling through Caroline, spent the night in the studio cities when it was named something else. He was on the second floor. During the, during the evening, the fire alarm went off and none of the egress lighting worked. So he fought his way out of his room, down the hallway, down the stairs, into the public way in the dark. He didn't come to the office, but he emailed me from Pennsylvania and said, hey, this is a, a concern. I filed that as a property maintenance complaint, went down, did an inspection of all the egress lighting, got all of that repaired, but that was as far as the authority in the code allowed me to go. What we're proposing and, and what other jurisdictions do, because these are rental dwelling units, they fall under the R2 use group of the building code, we can do a limited property maintenance without doing it countywide and then that gives me or 
let's not say me, the, the <laughs> property maintenance official you appoint, Mike Fincham, um, the authority to go down. That would be him. And then we can, we can mandate we need to inspect 10% of the rooms. They pick or we pick the 10%. And then as we find things, we can expand that. And what you see in this report would encompass that entire facility. It is unacceptable. And, and I guess, I don't know how other board members feel. I just don't want us doing someone else's job. That, that's the part that concerns me. I, I still don't have any problem with us being able to address these issues. And if, if that falls under the county's uh, uh, ability or the county's job, if you will, to do that, but if, if the health department or some other state entity has the responsibility of doing this and they're not doing it, I don't want us to assume responsibility that someone else or some other entity has. Oh, yes, sir. And this is twofold. Within that report, half of that responsibility is ours because it's the uh, smoke detectors, it's the plumbing, it's the structural integrity, it's the life safety issues as far as guardrails, handrails on the stairs. That part is ours. The, the bed bugs, the silverfish, the mold, that would be the health department, and it would be a joint effort. So it's about 50-50 in the report whose responsibility it is. Okay, other board members? Well, I have just, just one, Mr. Taylor. We've been, uh, we've been working, I'm sorry Mrs. Beard left, but we've been working with this area for, I guess, since I had hair, which is a long time ago. And, and we had complaints about the, the water was the problem, and... We fix the water issues, and really, it's it's just become embarrassing. Yes, sir. Um, if you've read the reviews on the web, it's you know, please pass this exit. Don't stop here. Yes, sir. Uh, I don't know how the government can, you know, actually control or regulate a building, but if you're going to run a hotel in Carolina, it's got to at least be a certain standard. So I think this is a first step in moving that standard, and maybe we should be more aggressive. I mean, I would go for as, as aggressive as possible because my patience level is not what it used to be, but we, we need to fix this as soon as possible. And, Mr. Thomas, the, the approach would be, if we adopted this ordinance, go in and hit them all full scale. It's going to take a little while, get them up online. And then once they're online, then it's a maintenance schedule, an inspection of, like I said, 10%, and, and the authority is in the maintenance code to allow us to do that. And I feel when I get a complaint, and the example I'll use is the firefighter out of Pennsylvania, went through, made sure, and I kind of stretched it a little bit, got exit lighting and smoke detectors in the hallways because I couldn't go into each room. I didn't have the authority, but the smoke detectors in the hallway, we got all of those up to speed. What you see in this report is that same motel and them smoke detectors that are gone, the only thing that's left is is what you attach it to, who knows where they are. Here we're back again some two years later. So with a maintenance program, I think we can prevent the severity of what you see in this report. But I mean, the, the photos, the photos are, are embarrassing if not illegal, but I have a personal story. One of my constituents who I know and love very well was at our house when the power went out. She drove to Carmel Church to have a place to stay with lights and after 10 minutes drove back home and said, I'd rather be at home in the dark with no power than down there. So it's that bad and we really need to fix it because we're doing a lot of things, a lot of good things in that area. I imagine we're going to have a lot of visitors in that area soon, so we need to do all we can to make it better. I don't know what was a cultural thing or whatever, but Mr. we need to fix it now. My okay. other my other concern in in going along with the the fire safety stuff is the one from uh, Ricky Madiak where there's a private fire hydrant that doesn't work and there's no smoke detectors. So you end up with a fire and somebody shows up there. The fire hydrant doesn't work. The smoke detectors don't work. We have a, we have a real catastrophe. I just the pictures. I mean the the pictures were just un. I mean, did they let you into these rooms to take these pictures? Did you have any issues of... Actually, it was fortuitous. The, the complaint we had 
from a gal that was staying there. I went there and she wasn't home or, or wouldn't respond. Um, so as I'm looking, there's doors where there's no doorknobs, no room numbers, and the doors are partially open. Well, to me, that's access. And they, they, they laugh about the one they call it the Jumanji room. That's the photos of the mold coming and the bathroom. And, and, and there's multiple rooms like that. There were no doorknobs? Nothing. Zero. The picture. And, and on top of that, for fire and rescue, if you see further in the report, the the number of times we're responding over there is is really sapping the resources from fire and rescue and the sheriff's department that can be utilized elsewhere in the county. Mr. Whiteman, I got it, Mr. Chairman. Okay. So can Mr. the owners of these facilities can they be fined for for some of the stuff that we're seeing here? Yes. Now we adopt. Uh, I mean, are we are we are we doing that, or do we have to? We have to this? take the steps to get there. Okay. We adopt the property maintenance code. We converge, we do the inspections, we annotate the violations, give them X amount of time to get them abated. They're not done, then we go see Judge Watner, get them into court, and then at that time, yes. Now, we can't, the building code is not punitive, um, so we don't have finding capability, but that's when we take it into the courts. Wait, is this like, is this like regular property maintenance now? If I have to hire somebody to go in and clean up their building, I get to charge them? Well, we, no, we. And if you say through, no, how do I make it like that? Through the property, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, through the property maintenance code, once they're given the directive and they don't comply, then we go to the courts. And the courts inspire them to See, the, affect the, the repair. The court doesn't have the same black eye that the county has. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm trying to put a stake on my eye so it's no longer black. So mm -hmm. how do I do that? And I like Mr. Black's suggestion, but again, I want to be as aggressive as possible. So can I mean, we bake something in to the property maintenance code you want us to adopt and say, if it's not corrected within the time period, the county has the authority to correct it because you're running a public enterprise that involves the health, safety, and welfare of travelers going throughout the county, we'll fix it but you're responsible. Yeah, and I think through the USBC, there is a, the authority of the USBC Part 1, which gets you to Part 3, the maintenance code. There is a fee schedule that is like the building code when yes. you get a building permit. So we can do a fee schedule that will cover the inspections and then failed inspections, whatever we set that fee at would be incentive but as far as but as far as hiring a contractor to work on somebody else's property, the, the USBC. Well, I, I guess but, my I guess my question is this. I think I read in here it's last night. And correct me if I'm wrong. I, there was a there was moldy drywall, and the, someone put the just fresh drywall over the mold. That's correct. I mean that's that's just downright criminal. Right. And I mean there's no way yeah, that these people should be. To, I, yes, sir. To you and I, that's criminal. But you get into court. And you get some milk toast guys, and they're like, well, no, that's just sloppy workmanship. He didn't know mold was bad. And then you got to prove he knew mold was bad. Yeah, it's a slippery slope. So, so, so Mr. Mr. It's just workmanship, but so I, I get into that every day. So, Mr. Whiteman, Sir. Um, it would seem to me that since you are our expert, resident expert, um, I think we should rely on you to give us some directive and start putting things to paper for to determine how we move forward. And if this is the first step, certainly we have to have second and third steps to protect our citizens as well as people traveling through the county. So I think we ought to use your guidance and leadership in terms of where we go legally to make sure we dot every I and cross every T. Yes, sir. Let, let me ask just before that, and Mr. because I'll get right to you. Right. Would it be since it, it, everybody seems to want to do what we can do to make this as effective as possible, I see this two ways. Should we adapt what we have here and then go to the next step, or should we maybe do an emergency ordinance? I, you know, I don't know, but I guess my question is, what is the best way to address what we've talked about? Sir, it's my opinion that uh, Mr. Fincham and I get together with the 
the property maintenance code, write an ordinance, get it to Mr. Emerson, check the legality of it, and, and we'll have the parameters in there. And then how we enforce it is already there. It, the property maintenance code already exists. It'll be for that combined area that, that we have designated, and it's the, the residential units, because that's all we're allowed to do. This, you, you, you can't use the property maintenance code for, for people in single family dwellings. This is people that rent facilities for other people to use. So, so people, the last time, some years ago when we had the property maintenance code, people were afraid we were going to tell them what color their gutters could be and how tall their grass can be. That's not the case here. This is for rental units only. So once we adopt the ordinance, Part 3 of the Uniform Statewide Building Code, we enforce that just like we enforce the building code. All the parameters are there, how to do it, how it's done, everything's already written for us. So we need to go ahead and adopt what you have, what you have here and then proceed with a second step? We, we, need, we need to prepare the ordinance, get it blessed by legal counsel that it, oh go ahead. Mr. Chairman, we actually need to prepare the ordinance for first reading for you to review and consider that you can then authorize us to go to public hearing with that ordinance. Okay, so so what about this request that you made for tonight? That's just, that is the request, sir. You okay. just make a motion to adopt. Okay. Can I ask a question? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Uh, have we shared these pictures and the information you put together with this board with the health department? Uh, they were with me, sir. They were with you all the It was a joint inspection. And, we did it together. And, and you say there's nothing you can do about it on their end? No. Um, when, it, when they got me the reports, because I said, hey, I would like to compile that to, to present to the board, um, they said they were looking at doing their hotel, hotel inspection program or, or something to that effect. And the gal that's running it, she got married this weekend. And she's on her honeymoon this week, but I, I, what we're trying to do, I understand, is fix the problem in the long run. And I understand that completely, and I'm all for that, and we need to do that. But I'm just, I just think we need to do something now in order to help with the issue, because you know, I go by that, that one hotel on 95, right off 95, you can see it, and, and there, there are lots of cars there. So there are a lot of people staying in that hotel or a motel or whatever it's called. Extended and stay. It, it, is, it is sad because I'm, there are some kids in that, in that place as well that yes, are staying sir. there, that are having to live in that mess. And it appears to me that we, there's something we need, we can do. Uh, how, how fast can you explain You know, it's just, it just has to be something we can do to, to protect those children. Because I can tell you, I've seen children catching a bus there. But we don't okay? So I know they do. Mr. Mr. Akers, yes. our issue is not uncommon, is, is not limited to us. We have some articles from some of our neighboring jurisdictions that are dealing with the same issue. Okay. So what we'd like to do is to have the comprehensive package for first reading for you all to look at at, at your next meeting, which would be Excellent. November 12th, I believe. Sometime in no right. uh, mid-November, yes. And, and we'll also be looking at... Um, the extended occupancy issue as well. Okay, so you're saying there's nothing we can do between now and the middle of October to get the first reading, and then it has to go to public hearing, I'm sure, and uh, that's going to take another two weeks. Uh, what is it? We'll talk to Mr. Emerson, and perhaps we can uh, address that issue in the form of an emergency ordinance, but I would not want to tell you tonight that we can do that. I would want to talk to Mr. Emerson. I, I don't think, want to wait two weeks. I <laughs> think know, there's an emergency November ordinance we can problem. do. There's got to be a way we can have an emergency can, ordinance. Can, 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 uh, Mr. Can, Mr. Mr. Underwood, Mr. Chairman, can, 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 can during our, during our um, break, can we get Mr. Fincham and Council just to start talking and see where we can go with this and bring this back to have further discussion on this? Well, you could advertise a public hearing for your next meeting. You really don't need an emergency so We could adopt it at our next meeting. Okay. Okay, so what we would like for you to do is to get together with Ms. Emerson. Uh, we'll take a, it's time for us to take a, a break anyway, and you can come back and then we can, you can draw something up or 
we can advertise for public hearing for the next meeting. Okay. Yeah, let's come back and discuss this. I don't okay. Know. Okay. Uh, we can recess until seven thirty. We will now reconvene the Carolina County Board of Supervisors meeting October thirteenth. Um, just before we go to public hearing, um, we were on agenda item nine. Uh, basically, what we're doing is um, preparing for public hearing uh, an ordinance. So, do we need to take action on the what we were with the what's on the agenda tonight in order to do that. Okay, so we need to do that in the form of a motion. Okay. So we need a motion to authorize public hearing. Mr. Chairman, I, I will make the motion to authorize public hearing for our uh, pers pursuit of property maintenance issue in what was called the uh, property maintenance district, I guess, at Carmel Church. Second. Okay, we move in a proper second that we would authorize public hearing for the uh, Virginia Property Maintenance Code, limited property maintenance code. All in favor, let it be known by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, motion carries unanimously. Okay, that takes us to uh, the public comment section of our meeting. And I do apologize, we are running a few minutes late. Uh, but this is the public comment section of the meeting. If there are citizens here who would like to address the board on any issue that's not on the agenda or not a public hearing, you may come forth at this time. It, are there citizens who would like to address the board on any issue that's not a public hearing or not on the agenda, you may come forward at this time. Again, if there are any citizens who would like to address the board on any issue that's not a public hearing or on the agenda, you may come forward at this time. Uh, seeing no one with the desire to speak, I will close the public comment section of the meeting. That takes us to public hearings. Agenda item number four is a rezoning 02 2015 Borden Randall J. BG Partners LLC Walden Albert Douglas Owners McKinney and Company Applicant. Request a rezoning from uh, rural preservation with a density of one DU per 10 acres of land to M1 industrial, no specified density, comprised of a portion of tax map number 82-A-157, 53 acres, tax map number 82-A-159 in its entirety, and tax map number 82-A-160 in its entirety, and totaling 190 acres plus or minus. This property is generally bounded on the west by I-95 North and the North and East by Cool Water Drive, Route 652, and generally north of Ridgefield Road, Carmel Church Loop, the Mattapanai Voting District. The proposed use is a storage warehouse and distribution facility. The 2030 Comprehensive Plan identifies this area as being located in the Carmel Church Growth Area designated as planned development. Mr. Finchin. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, your first public hearing tonight uh, is the aforementioned RZ02-2015. The request is to rezone approximately 190 acres on all or a portion of uh, three different tax parcels uh, from rural preservation to M1 industrial uh, with conditions. Um, the board is a, very aware of this application. This is the application for the uh, large warehouse and distribution uh, center that the board previously authorized 
uh, an expedited public uh, hearing and review process for this application. The applicant is requesting the M1 zoning to allow the construction of up to 1.5 million square feet for a, a warehouse, office, and distribution facility uh, related to uh, grocery products. The development application that you have, including the GDP, uh, the elevations that have been included in your packet, are uh, what the generally the, the applicant has agreed to and has been discussed with the board in your uh, and planning commission in previous discussions. The various review agencies were submitted, uh, were provided a copy of the application. You have uh, a few comments from the agencies uh, that we would expect to receive comments from. Uh, we have a modified uh, traffic improvements to the uh, Carmel Church Loop uh, and cool, cool Water Drive intersection to accommodate uh, the turn movements into and out of the facility. Um, there are a number of wetlands on the property which posed a challenge uh, in, in designing and locating the facility. Um, those issues have been overcome as well as uh, other environmental issues that have arisen along the way. Um, the subject property would be provided by uh, public water and sewer from the county. That would be a relatively uh, easy extension from our existing Carmel Church facilities to serve the site. The Planning Commission held its public hearing and forwarded this action, uh, this application to the Board of Supervisors with a recommendation of approval. Uh, so you have the packet in front of you, including the uh, comments from the various uh, review agencies um, and the proffers as they have been submitted. And with that, I'll address any questions that the Board may have. Does the Board have questions for Mr. Fincham prior to the opening of the public hearing? If not, I will open the public hearing for rezoning 02-2015 as presented. Is there anyone who would like to speak to this rezoning? You may come forward, state your name, and your district if it's applicable. I am Bonnie Woods. I live on Ridgefield Road, which is uh, south of the proposed facility. Um, <clears throat> I was at the planning and zoning meeting and I do have minutes of the meetings. Um, there, was, there was not a VDOT officer present at the time. Um, it says here that Frank Wilson stated they had a scoping meeting with VDOT and VDOT required additional traffic counts at the exit from I-95 and no other counts are required along Coolwater Drive. He said he believes this to be a pretty low use road, which I contest. He said usually VDOT focuses on truck traffic rather than automobile traffic. The last impact study was done January of 2013. We are fast approaching 2016, so in a few months we will be three years out from this traffic study. The, <clears throat> the study that I was provided shows that there was a traffic study done. It used figures, and this was done again in January. Now, I write commercial truck insurance for a living in Caroline County. That's what I do. And I do know for a fact that in January through March, that is the lowest time for a lot of truckers. So with this impact study being done in January, I feel that it has lower than normal traffic venues. Now, I was also spoke with the engineer, Peter Hedrick, of VDOT in Fredericksburg. Ask him about some of these studies that I have looked at. And the Route 207 at Coolwater has a rating in 2013 of C. D or better is passing. Estimated for 2014 was also a C rating. This is now, again, 2015. By the time this facility is going to be built, it will be 2018. We will be how many years out from this traffic study? The population is, is increasing in Caroline County. 
along with the traffic volume. Back to my issue of Cool Water Drive. That is a thoroughfare from Route 1 to Carmel Church. A lot of people use that. I think it's a much higher use than the county believes it to be. I seriously request that the Board of Supervisors table this until an impact study is done on the Cool Water Loop and Cool Water Drive itself to address exactly how much traffic we have traveling those corridors. And I would like it to be done at a time that is not a low peak time for tractor trailer traffic. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. And I have copies of all this if anyone would like to request it in an email. Thank you very much. If you would like, you may give it to Mr. Pardon. He can distribute it for us so that each of us will have it if you would like to do that. Um, certainly. I okay. You can mail it to us, Ms. Woods, if you'd like to. Okay, uh, maybe it might be easy if you just email it to the county administrator. He could see that we get copies of it. Mr. Park. Alan can take care of that part. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak regarding this rezoning? Is there anyone who would like to speak regarding this rezoning? Over here. Oh. Hi, my name is Lori White. I live um, on Moncure Drive, 1031 Moncure Drive, really close to where the facility is proposed to be built. Um, I was concerned about environmental impact because it is um, a large rural wooded area and as they stated at wetlands and all and I was curious what they're doing to kind of counteract the environmental impact like are they going to try to use any green technology like green roofs or bio sweeps or let me see I have some research <laughs> what the things are called um, bio swales um, permeable pavement permeable pavement or cisterns because a one million square foot facility is huge, and they're going to be wiping out a lot of places. Honestly, a lot of woodland creatures and all the critters live, and all and for us who live around there, you know, it's like where are they going to go? You know, because <laughs> they got to live somewhere, so they're going to end up on our property. And I love the animals, and I'm concerned about the environment and that, and the impact it's going to have for those of us who live so close to it. And uh, most of us have well water. I know I do, and I just want to make sure there's not going to be anything that's going to seep into that. Um, there's already a problem on cool water. Every time we have a big rain, um, trash comes up, which I think is probably thrown into that big pond from the apartments and all over there. That's already had an environmental impact, you know, and maybe if they want to build the facility, they can do something positive for the environment, like help keep that clean, you know, or help do something for the environment if they do build it that remains, you know, or something like a green roof or something like that to, to help counteract the environmental impact and make sure there's no runoff or anything that affects us that live around there. Um, and I think it would be a great job opportunity for us to live in the area. That's wonderful. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but my main concern is for the environment. And I mean, I know if eventually something's going to be built there, this sounds like a positive facility. Um, it's better than a lot of other alternative things. Um, like I said, good job opportunity. Sounds like a good, comp positive company. But I, my main concern is with the environmental impact. It's going to be such a huge, um, you know, change. They're going to tear down lots and lots of trees and possible wetlands. And like they said, it's hard to try to build around that. So, okay, that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who would like to speak regarding this rezoning? Is there anyone else who would like to speak regarding this rezoning? Finally, is there anyone else who would like to speak regarding this rezoning? Good evening, Mr. Chairman, um, members of the Board of Supervisors. Good My evening, name... sir. Sorry? Good evening. Good evening, Good evening sir. sir. My name is Frank Wilson with McKinney and Company, and um, I am representing Harris Tedev on this uh, rezoning. Um, as you can see, unfortunately, I cannot see that picture, but we've got, we are going to have, I don't intend to bore you with a PowerPoint presentation, but I just want to put Go ahead. 
advance this thing? Do I use these buttons here? <laughs> okay, that, that's good enough. Okay. That is pretty much the same general development plan that I believe is printed on this board. Um, Aristida has um, acquired two and a portion of uh, 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 a portion of the Borden property that will be consolidated into 196 acres in order to uh, develop a, an ultimately 1.5 million square foot uh, grocery distribution uh, facility as you heard. The, the planning for this and the location of the building and on all the dry and the driveways has been done to minimize environmental impacts um, in spite of the fact that those pink lines that you see around the streams are RPA or resource protection area lines and wetlands run down those streams and there are many many acres of wetlands and RPA and in spite of that we will be disturbing something like 0.66 of one acre of wetlands and we'll be disturbing less than 180 feet of stream approximately half of the site will not even be disturbed the, the green that you see there will be undisturbed uh, vegetation so a concern and those are the areas where you where you find the 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 the, the species that need to be protected and the little creatures that most people are concerned about they're not in the upland area where the, where the building is going to be located. They are actually in the part of the site that is going to be left in, in, intact, left as it is at the moment. Um, we've, uh, we've done, besides the normal wetland investigation, we have done a, a special study to determine if there is an endangered plant species called a swamp pink and they, are, they could not find any, any trace of swamp pink. And in addition to that, uh, we are doing an archeological study because Caroline County and adjacent areas have a, um, have a record of prehistoric of findings of, of relics and prehistoric um, artifacts and resources. And because of that fact, um, Harris Teeter agreed to an archaeological study that's costing them about $22,000. It's being done as we, well not as we speak, but at the moment. And we should have um, a verbal in about two to three weeks. But as of the present time, the archaeologist hasn't found anything uh, of any significance in the area. So I believe that they have gone kind of above and beyond to try and ensure that, they, that this facility will not be disturbing valuable species uh, and endangering the environment. The stormwater management is done in accordance with the latest state uh, DEQ and uh, uh, requirements that were enacted in about July of 2014. Um, the new stormwater regulations focus on volume control instead of peak control and that makes a very big difference to the size of stormwater, uh, stormwater facilities. It also encourages more overland flow than used to be the case before. So there will be swales, there will be as much uh, a pervious area as we can practically incorporate into a, situ into a facility like that that is very heavy traffic, and, uh, but it will be done. We, we haven't gotten to the point where we've done construction drawings and detailed design that we, we, we are setting up the, the facility to incorporate those features. So I believe that um, my client is, um, has been very environmentally um, conscious and responsive and we've still got to go through a, a, a full site plan a design review process that comes back to the county. Uh, VDOT has been involved in discussions and, uh, and other agencies. So. Um, if you have any questions, I think, I think I've covered all of the, the main points and um, I'd, I'd like to attempt to answer questions if you have any. Okay. So what we will do is go ahead and uh, finish the public hearing sure. and then board members may have concerns or questions 
And and if so, we will address them at that time. Okay? Thank you, sir. All right. Is there anyone else who would like to speak regarding this uh, rezoning? Is there anyone else who would like to speak regarding this rezoning? Finally, is there anyone else who would like to speak regarding this rezoning? Uh, it has to be someone different, ma'am. You've already spoke. If someone else would like to speak for you, okay, seeing no one with the desire to speak, I will now close the public hearing. Board members have questions for the applicant. Okay. I'll go first and just okay. some questions and I'll, I'll pass. Um, was it Mr. Wilson? Yes. If you could give me a second. Um, Mrs. Wood spoke about the traffic study, and I understand I'm very sympathetic with her with regards to VDOT, and I know VDOT will do things that aren't necessarily common sense. Um, so you have... Uh, uh, or are you going to address the traffic? Let me let me ask about the other thing. She was at the planning commission. Yes. And she mentioned a cemetery that yes. was in the back, and you said you are not going to disturb the cemetery. Correct. Okay. Um, well, we have found out that the cemetery is on the Borden property, and it's in the portion of the property that's not being purchased. So it's it's not within the footprint of this development. So that's not being purchased. Correct. So that'll be. It's further to the north. That'll be the next project, so right, right now it's yes, undisturbed. <laughs> All right, so that's a, that's a good thing. Um, yes. Now, with respect to the traffic concerns in our preliminary packet, we have, uh, and I guess we took it off, but the original slide you showed, you're going to actually build another lane. Yes. Uh, to turn left into the property. Yes. That left turn lane will then have a an adjacent lane going the same, I guess, northern direction. That'll be undisturbed, so car traffic will continue to go while trucks wait that, to make a left. That is correct. There will be coming from the other way a right turn in lane, so traffic should, for the most part, be minimally impacted, I guess yes. I'll say. Okay. What guarantees do we have that the traffic uh, lanes will be constructed, as we've stated just now? Um, the traffic, they, the, the, the development will be done in accordance with the drawing that you see in front of you, and that incorporates the widening of Cool Water Drive from the loop to the, to the entrance and slightly beyond, so to get a, a, a turn, turn lanes. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, uh, we have to comply with VDOT site distance requirements. Right. In other words, we have to have a clear sight distance to the north of about 500 feet, and we've actually been there, we've taken photographs, and that is very doable. There will have to be some cutting of vegetation to, to, give, you good, to, to give you good sight distance at, the, at this new intersection. Okay. There, there's, uh, the distance from the new in intersection back to the loop is about 380 feet or something like that. It's not, so the sight distance will not be an issue but there's not a lot of stacking room within Cool Water Drive for, for if, if there should be a holdup on the loop. But the driveway from uh, Cool Water Drive back to the, to the warehouse, right. as you can see from the drawing, is a very long driveway, right. and that could accommodate a lot of trucks if they, if they had to queue up. So they wouldn't necessarily be waiting or, or queued up or in line on cool water, they'd actually Correct. be on your property while they're waiting to unload or load in either case. And, and one thing, I'd, you know, I mean, I've, I've heard what the previous speaker said, and I'd certainly do uh, uh, sympathize and or, or empathize. I think that, may, uh, that one of the things we could consider doing is, is striping um, the entrance from the residential area onto cool water drive as being, you know, to keep the intersection clear. Cars and, only or something like that. Or, something, or, or some kind of signage. I mean, that's not going to stop the occasional right. vehicle from stopping there during, you know, instead of leaving that intersection open, but I think it would help. Okay. And that's yeah. a big key. And then Mrs. Um, Mrs. White, was it White or Wright? Mrs. Wright. Wright? Okay, I'm sorry, Mrs. Wright. Uh, you, I think you, for the most part, addressed her environmental concerns. We've shown the resource-sensitive areas. They're not going to be disturbed. Correct. Um, she did mention something about green roofs and things of that nature. Was that in your plan? 
Um, green roofs are, can be used in, under certain circumstances, but for a big warehouse like this, a green roof is not a practical solution there. But that is not the only way of controlling, um, of, of controlling runoff. There are other right. ways. And in a, in a very large building like this, it's best to, to, um, to do it next to the paved areas, have um, grass-lined swales that will encourage infiltration into the soil instead of just piping as traditionally what you did was you, you piped from the downspout all the way to the detention pond. That's the way designs always were done. The new requirements are such that you are encouraged to disconnect the storm drains. In other words, the downspouts will get to, a, you have to worry about icing on the, on the, on the driveways, right. of course, but you will have the pipes crossing the road and then discharging into surface ditches and grass line swales. And they will run the length of the, dry, of the building because those detention ponds, there are two of them. Yeah. Are, that's a very, very large site. You can have very long open ditches and swales between where the pipes open up all the way down to the stormwater management facilities. Okay. So. It sounds like you've addressed most, yeah. most of her concerns, um, and I, I just wanted to make sure those yeah. are the folks that I represent in particular, so I want to make sure that sure. they're satisfied. Um, yeah. We have to actually get VDOT to come out and do another study, which has nothing to do with your project, and trust me, they yeah. did studies before about noise before the project was built, and then said that yeah. noise was an issue after the project was done. So we'll, we'll yeah. work on VDOT. I think there is another VDOT issue with the um, pond on Cool Water Drive, which may not impact your project, has nothing to do with it. That's another thing we'll work on. Yeah. Um, last question, can you indulge me? Joburg or Cape Town? <laughs> Port Elizabeth. Okay. Thank you, sir. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, no, no questions, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Underwood, I just have a couple questions for uh, Mr. Wilson. If you... Mr. Wilson, as the um, person representing McKenna, I know you guys have talked about level of, I'm sure, waste or uh, within the facility. Tell me, tell me about how you're going to move the waste or if product goes bad, have you? You know, traditionally for these big distribution facilities, um, let's first of all talk about the, the clean packaging. Mm -hmm. They would have compactors and, and, and a protocol for, for disposing of waste. I don't know exactly what they would be doing for product that goes bad mm -hmm. or aging, but um, all, I could, all I could say is, you know, Harris Teeter and Kroger, who owns Harris Teeter, have right. been around for a long time. Absolutely. And I'm sure that, you know, that's something we could follow up on during the site plan stage. But um, they are going to be good citizens, and, uh, and you know, th this is a very, very large investment for them, and then they, they're going to do it properly. Absolutely. Well, you know, like I said, as Ms. Wright said, with most of the county being on county water, it's something that we always want to talk about is our, our water supply for, for yeah. our residents. Um, my second question is, the, the queue line that is going to be in front of the facility, how long, how, how far back is that, did you say, the, that you could actually stack, if there was a, something going on on cool water on 207, how far back is the ingress to the property? I'd say it's probably about 2,000 feet. About 2,000 feet. Mm. Okay. It's, it's, a, it's a long way. I, I could get a scale out and scale it if you want. Okay. No, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Appreciate it. Mr. Akers? Yeah. Mr. Steely? I have one question, and I want to go further back to the light coming off of, off of 207 hmm. onto uh, the loop road. Hmm. Well, and maybe we need Gary Wilson also. Do we know, since you're both Gary Wilson, that's kind of odd. Or Frank Wilson and Gary Wilson. Um, Not related. Do we, <laughs> do we have, do we know, Gary, what this, how much stacking we have on 207 making that turn in front of the visitor center? Uh, I don't have that data for you at the moment. We don't have, I, personally I can tell you, living there 
and working there. Right. Um, we don't have, I've yet to see an occasion where traffic did not completely rotate through a cycle of light. Well, I understand that. I'm just saying, do we know what the amount of stacking we can do on 207, making that left turn into the road? I mean, we're worried about in front of the facility. I'm mm -hmm. coming a little bit further back. On the cool water. Mm -hmm. Man, yeah, or cool, or cool water on 207. Common Church Loop where the light right, is. Right, where the light is in front minutes. of the visitor center, you know, yeah, going towards 95. Does that left turn lane go all the way? How far back does it really go? Oh, it, it goes oh. Uh, practically to the... 7-Eleven. Uh, yeah, to the, actually goes to, to the interchange practically. It, it's a Yeah, it's, a, long, it's two long left turn lanes now. All the way from, and that's what I didn't remember was how Golden far Corral back. from about Golden Corral all the way to the light. It's two left turn lanes. It's a very long stack. Uh, the number of trucks we're talking about, though, it's, it's significant. It represents a very small percentage of the traffic that currently. No, I, I understand that. That's why I'm curious what we can stack because that's not the only facility that we the trucks will use. I mean, there are left turns off of that before they get to where Harris Teeter will be. But you know, they will be going into what we used to be. Left Petro, in, whatever. Left and, left and right. Yeah. You're going into Love's in the back. Right. So I'm, I'm just light. curious how, how, do we have 2,000 feet there? Can we just oh. find that out? We can find that out. I think that's a, yeah, I think, I think it's a I very think it's likely it's distance. It's 2,000 feet. Uh, I, I would think that you have, you have a very okay. long. Okay. I'm just, I don't remember how much is there. I yes, just, I, I'm, if we're talking about stacking, I'm looking all the way back to where we, because it's not on his. Yeah, you won't. You it would won't. be the first map you had. The first map you have. Pull up the first chart you have, Mr. Wilson. The, the first drawing. Do you it, have another other, drawing? Be, you had another drawing, right? Where's the other drawing? Because I do have it in the in the color in, in our color version. I just can't tell. I mean, we have. I don't know how big that is. But it's it's hard to determine how far back that goes. Yeah, it's it's. Well, it's two yeah, lanes, just, so it's, it's two, at I least just, a quarter mile per lane. Yeah, at least. So we, that's another half a mile, which is 2,000 feet. Uh, Mr. Seeley, maybe I... Uh, there, there's there's over there. Joey's got GIS on his phone. Can he tell us? Oh, no, he's got remote control. Oh, he's got remote control. Uh, okay. Mr. Seeley, you mentioned Love's um, as, a, as a potential traffic issue. That's actually a... a that's right. the right. No, that's Mr. The right. Thomas, I'm looking at, at what used to be... Um, Petro I makes see. the left off of that road as well as um, Harris Teeter will. How can we get this on the screen? Well, the, no, you mean the left off of 207? No, off of, off of, off of um, Carmel Church Loop. The Carmel Church Loop. They will make no, a right off of Carmel, Carmel right. Church Loop. Right. That's where oh, I see. Because the okay. they'll go to, Petro they'll make a right left. so they can go up to Coolwater to then make a left to go in. Everybody oh, else okay. continues on Carmel Church Loop to make a right into Golden Corral or a left into whatever that one is, Mr. Fuel. There's one left on the right. They will con most the, the trucks right. now will continue around Carmel Church Loop as they have done Everything before. Everything off of the Carmel Church Loop that we have is a left, except Arby's. Arby's is a, a left right. off of Carmel a Church right. Loop. Is a right. Is a Everything else a is left. a left. Everything else is a left. Off of Carmel Church Loop. Yeah, that goes a left off of the yeah. loop road. The Carmel Ingress. Church. Carmel Church Loop comes to the light, then yeah, it's you, cool, you water cool water after, after you get there. Right. So everything off of Carmel Church yeah, Loop, that's cool water when you get to Arby's. It's kind of crazy how it works, but that's cool water when you get to Arby's. Which one do you want? This is Carmel Church Loop. See Carmel Church Loop. This is about 1,300 feet from there to there. You can't, you can't go there. You can't go there. You've got to come to the light. You've got to go all the way past. You've got to go, right. You've got to go to the light. That's where the 2,000 feet is almost from Carmel Church Loop back to Arby's. Well, back to um, Golden Corral. It's almost two lanes all the way there. And as they make the left to get on the Carmel Church Loop, existing traffic will continue going around to the left. This project, you'll make a right and then make a left going in. Mm -hmm. That's why it's important to Mrs. Woods and the other folks in that area that there are additional lanes 
once you get on the cool water, because then they're not impacted adversely when they, when they go on their way home. OK. I, incidentally, I've, I've checked on the drawing. The, the length of the driveway is about 1,800 feet. Okay. Your driveway? Yes. OK. Third of a mile. Thank you very much. Um, and, and not just the uh, developer, but certainly the citizens themselves who have come out. And we thank you for your questions. Um, I assure you, from this board um, and this developer, we're going to do whatever is necessary to continue to make this project be a win-win for everybody. Um, when I found out that Harris Teeter was looking at this county, um, I did studies of my own. I, I went on the internet and I went different places to find out uh, what I could about the company. I can tell you uh, they are rated very high. In the communities where they are located, they are considered to be extremely good business people and an asset to the communities where they are located. And I believe that they're going to be the same for Carlin. Uh, they're going to provide some jobs that are going to be extremely nice jobs for our citizens uh, in this county. Not that they're going to hire everybody from here, but certainly uh, our citizens, I believe, will have an opportunity to get gainful employment uh, through this development. And so I, I, I'm sure we've talked about environment, and we are concerned about environment. But I can tell you, if you can get past DEQ, we won't have a problem, I, I assure you. Uh, they are going to make certain that the area, the environment is, 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 is properly taken care of. Uh, we're going to do what's necessary to take care of the traffic. And it is not to say that there are going to be some issues, but we're going to work those issues out. So having said that, how does the board wish to address this rezoning? Mr. Chairman, if I could make a motion, um, and the, the reality is we have actually, Mr. Mr. Gary Wilson um, has been working on this project, and I think I've been working on them with it for five years. Um, we actually had this project several years ago, but the person that was in charge of the project passed away, and they started all over, and then Kroger purchased Harris Teeter, and we finally gotten to the point here, and I, I, I respect Mrs. Woods, and I'm, I've asked to speak to her later uh, um, to make sure we fix the traffic issues that, that, that may come up and, and try to catch as many of those ahead of time. But having said that, I, I think the county would welcome this project, uh, and I'm going to make a motion to approve uh, RZ02-2015. Is there a second? second? It's been moved and properly second that we would approve the rezoning for RZ02-2015 as presented. All in favor, let it be known by saying aye. 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 All opposed, motion carries unanimously. That takes us to agenda item number five, special exception 03-2015, Auburn Properties, LLC owner, uh, cellular partnership, DBA, Verizon Wireless Africa request a special exception permit in accordance with Articles 17, Section 13 standards for special use permits and Article 4, Rural Preservation, Section 5.21 of the Carolina County Zoning Ordinance on Tax Map Number 28A36, part of consisting of 1.0 acres more or less. This property is located on Whitford Road, Route 626, approximately 3,600 miles east of Page Road, Route 605, Port Royal Voting District, proposed use communication facility, a telecommunication tower. The 2030 comprehensive plan identifies this property as agricultural preservation with a density of one dwelling unit per 25 acres of land. Mr. Fenton. 
Mr. Chairman, members of the board, your next public hearing, as you stated, is SPEX 03-2015. Uh, the applicant is requesting a special exception permit in accordance with Article 17, Section 13, uh, and Article 4, Section 5.21 to locate a telecommunications tower on uh, tax map 28-A-36. The special exception application is subject not only to conditions which may be imposed by the board, but to general standards that are included in the Caroline County Zoning Ordinance. The application was reviewed by the county's uh, telecommunications consultant, which recommended approval uh, due to uh, limited coverage in the area. Uh, and the fact that this facility would address coverage deficiencies and needs uh, with the location of this tower. The Planning Commission held a public hearing on this item and forwarded this request to the board with a recommendation of approval. Uh, the review, uh, the agency uh, comments uh, relative to the review are included in your packet. Pursuant to the Planning Commission recommendation, uh, staff was requested to prepare uh, <coughs> a, an additional ordinance amendment, which is included as, as potential condition 19 for the board's consideration to provide for the opportunity for uh, broadband uh, services should they be provided by the county. Uh, after uh, discussion with the county attorney on, on several occasions related to this issue, uh, we actually have concerns about that condition. Uh, we have two competing sets of regulations. We have the Federal Telecommunications Act, I believe, of 1994, and we also have federal legislation uh, relating to rural broadband. Um, we are subject in terms of what we can review, approve, and accept by the Telecommunications Act. Um, and we have some concerns about the ability to require um, or uh, impose a condition related to uh, uh, providing broadband service. I have discussed that with the attorney for the applicant. Uh, the attorney uh, tonight has requested that uh, uh, the board not act on this application uh, to allow uh, staff uh, and the attorneys to to look at that uh, condition um, and make sure that we are all on the same page uh, with that condition. With that, I'd recommend that you have the public hearing uh, on the matter. We close the hearing and defer action to your uh, November 12th meeting. Okay. Uh, does board members have questions prior to the opening of the public hearing? If not, we will open the public hearing for special exception 03-2015 Auburn Properties, LLC owner, uh, Cellular Partnership, DBA, Verizon Wireless applicant. Is there anyone who would like to speak regarding this special exception? <coughs> yes, sir. If you could state your name and who you represent. Will do, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. Members of the board, good evening. My name is Jeff Geiger, here on behalf of the applicant, Verizon Wireless. As staff mentioned, Verizon Wireless is requesting a special, special exception for a new wireless communications facility on Woodford Road, just east of Page Road. Verizon Wireless would like to use this new facility to bring high-speed, high-quality 4G LTE service to this area around this location. Verizon has demonstrated a lack of coverage in this area and the county's consultant has recommended approval for this request. The new site has been des designed to minimize its impact on the area while providing the 4G service that has become an integral part of our daily lives. The site will be constructed in compliance with your development standards for communication facilities, including the provision of four, a space for four users, including the county's emergency communication equipment. Verizon Wireless's request meets the standards for granting a special exception as set forth in our application. The design of this site has complete, successfully completed technical review committee review and has received a unanimous recommendation of approval from the Planning Commission. 
Verizon Wireless was made aware of today of a new condition um, that staff was recommending uh, to you. My client needs additional time to review this condition and to meet with staff to discuss this condition. For this reason, I, on behalf of my client, I do request that you defer action on this item until your November board meeting to give us time to talk about this condition further. Thank you. Be glad to answer any questions. Thank you, sir. Is there anyone else who would like to speak regarding this special exception? Is there anyone else who would like to speak regarding the special exception? Is there anyone else who would like to speak regarding the special exception? Seeing no one with the desire to speak, I will close the public hearing. Uh, it has been requested that we defer action until our November meeting uh, such that the uh, applicant as well as staff can get together and uh, determine the best uh, avenue to address the, uh, the issue. Okay, do you have a question? Okay, Mr. Seeley has a question. Mr. Geiger, I, Mr. Geiger, I have one question for you. Will this have any impact on the start schedule to build the tower? The delay? Yeah. Well, we're delaying 30. If we get approval today, we're 30 days ahead. You know, our schedule will be based on today's approval. We wait 30 days, you know, that schedule gets pushed back. Does it come off the table? No. Okay. I, I just, sometimes we had the Sparta cell tower. We had issues. It came mm -hmm. off the table. Um, it took us a year to get it back on and get it built, and I just don't want to be in the same situation for that area as well. Understand, we would like the opportunity to have a discussion on this topic. Okay. It, it's a topic we've talked about before, and we have to talk about it again. Thank you. Okay. okay. Other questions, board members? If not, we will entertain a motion to defer action until our November meeting. So, so moved. Second. Second. We moved in public. Second. Second. Whichever. <laughs> However you want to write it is okay. fine. It's been uh, moved by Mr. Thomas and second by Mr. Seeley that we would... Uh, defer action on special exception 03 2015 to our November meeting. All in favor, let it be known by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, motion carries. That takes us to agenda item number six proposed amendment of chapter 103, taxation, article 9, section 10369, A4, exempt, exemption for elderly and disabled persons. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, as you're aware, the purpose of this public hearing is to consider amending the county's taxation ordinance, uh, specifically to provide a partial exemption for real estate and mobile homes owned by elderly and disabled persons. The ordinance establishes uh, an annual uh, income eligibility threshold uh, and the amount of the maximum tax exemption that is made available. The proposed amendment before you tonight would increase the maximum income allowance from $35,000 to $40,000 and increase the maximum total tax exemption available from $800 to $1,000. This is the uh, approach that Commissioner of the Revenue, Sharon Carter, has recommended and she, as she believes it will uh, provide the greatest access to the tax relief uh, in the ordinance uh, rather than some of the other options that were previously discussed. Mrs. Carter is here tonight to help answer any questions. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'll try to answer any questions you may have. Board members have questions prior to the opening of the public hearing. Ms. Carter, would you like to speak prior to the public hearing? Or? Okay. 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 Um, we will now open the public hearing for the proposed amendment. Chapter 103, Taxation, Article 9, Section 103, 69A4, Exemption for Elderly and Disabled Persons. Is there anyone who would like to speak regarding this proposed amendment? Is there anyone who would like to speak regarding this proposed amendment? Is there anyone who would like to speak regarding this proposed amendment? 
seeing no one with the desire or the intention to speak, I will close the public hearing at this time and uh, ask if board members have questions, either for Mrs. Carter. If, if not, we can entertain a, a motion. Mr. Chairman, I would, I would make a motion that uh, we increase uh, the maximum income allowance from thirty-five to 40000 and increase the uh, maximum total tax exemption from eight hundred to 1000 I think we've seen in, in a packet in past correspondence that this is pretty normal for other counties, uh, our size, and some of our neighboring counties. Um, I did not agree going to $1,500, uh, but I think that $1,000 is fair. It does expand the the people that can participate in this program and so uh, that's my motion and if we get a second to second so moved and properly second that the proposed amendment uh, to chapter 103 a uh, taxation article 9 uh, section 103 69 a4 exemption for elderly and disabled persons be approved as presented all in favor let it be known by saying aye aye, aye. all opposed Motion carries. That takes us to agenda item number seven. Uh, continued discussion of possible county ownership for former frog level volunteer rescue squad building. Okay. Uh, Mr. Sheevil. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Good evening. Giving you an update on our progress uh, with the frog level rescue property. Um, the county attorney has finished his investigation into the title search uh, and, and the county would have the authority to resell that facility once ownership has been taken. So that part's kind of been cleared up. The environmental phase one study that was completed, um, very detailed report on uh, that property, uh, we did find that there was a fuel tank in the back of the facility that was used for heating the building. Um, that tank is approximately 750 gallons. Uh, the cost to have that tank removed was $1,800. Uh, there is a fuel program that's out there that we can tap into. We would have to pay $500 of that and the rest would be paid through that fund. Uh, at the front of the building, we did excavate for uh, looking for ground storage tanks and the possibility thereof. Um, there was some uh, testing <coughs> that was done that kind of indicated anomaly in that parking lot area that we needed to investigate. Uh, they thought possibly there were tanks in the ground. Uh, we did excavate, uh, found the lines that went to the tank, but the tanks were removed in the front of the building. That kind of brings us to a, a quandary. Uh, the current fund that's out there, um, since the property owner had changed, we would have to move the tanks if they were there, and then the fund would then cover any groundwater remediation. Because the tanks were already previously removed and there's no records of them being removed, uh, it kind of puts us in an area that we need to be cautious because the fund might not cover this because the tanks were not removed that was not recorded appropriately. Really what it comes down to is having to do a, what's called an environmental phase two where they'll drill two wells, do soil sampling, uh, and also drill a uh, groundwater monitoring well and take sampling from that and see what levels of contamination are in the ground. There was a smell of gasoline during the excavation so we know there's some kind of a release, especially knowing that 30 years ago that, that facility was in operation and, and it's been closed as a gas station that long. So there is definitely contamination. The good thing is that ground, uh, the, the ground itself, the soil, is very poor and it holds everything. Uh, as we were excavating in the rear of the building, um, you could see the oil was basically held within the soil and didn't actually absorb into the soil. Um, the soil is just, uh, it's more like a blue uh, marl clay, and it just holds everything. And because it was there, it didn't absorb into the ground as far as we can tell. So in order for us really to move forward, we would need to look at doing a phase two at the cost of $5,600. Um, and again, that would provide us with the soil sampling, water sampling. Once we know what the levels of contamination are, we would know if there has to be any groundwater remediation. Uh, once we do that sampling, we do have the responsibility to report that to DEQ um, so that if the county did not take ownership, the current owners would be required to do any remediation that's there once we know there's a contamination um, that needs to be cleaned. So it would have to be cleaned by somebody if there is an issue there. 
um, we would have to, once we do the phase two, we could then go to DEQ and ask them to look at this on a case-by-case -case basis. The good thing that helps us is, is the existing gas pump island is still there. The existing lines are still there. The vent that goes from the tanks, where the tanks used to be, are still on the building. So all that's evidence that there used to be tanks in the ground, uh, and we may be able to get that covered. However, that's a gray area, uh, and it's not cut and dry as it normally be if there were tanks in the ground. Normally, if there were tanks in the ground, the property owner would have to remove those, and then if there was any contamination, that fund would cover anything. Um, so at this point, it, it, staff would like direction from the board as to how you would like us to proceed. Okay. Board members have... Uh Additional questions for Mr. Shevel or okay. I could, Mr. Black? I just have, I mean, you had mentioned briefly in uh, when you started off, you said, because it says here, however, it still needs to be determined whether Union Bank and Trust loan taken up by Frogler uh, Volunteer Rescue Squad some time ago has been paid off. Uh, so the deed of trust um, securing it can be released. You said that issue has been cleared up? I'll have the answer to that tomorrow, Mr. Black. I, guess I spoke with uh, Union Bank this afternoon and uh, expect an answer back tomorrow. Okay. I guess my concern is, I mean, that, that to me is something that we should probably be addressing first before we are addressing the, I don't want to pay for an environmental study if, the, if this is not in, you see, where I'm, you see where I'm going with this, correct? Yes, sir. Yes, I mean, I, so that's my concern, Mr. Chairman. Mr. 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 Chairman, in, in light of what Mr. Parton just um, said, I think there's still some answers to be um, gotten regarding this um, matter. I think we should just table it, get all the facts, and come back and take a look at it at our next meeting. I don't think we should make any decision in the blind, particularly when he's talking about uh, some of the contamination, soil issues, tidal issues. I, I think it's getting a little too deep right now. So I think we need to kind of back away, come back, let the research be done, let the re report come back to us in November, and then we can discuss it and be educated. Okay, other, other questions or concerns? Seems to be the con, uh, consensus of the board that, that we would allow Mr. Sheba to continue investigating and certainly get answers to Mr. Black's concern as well as other board members' concerns, and then we will, so we will table it until such time when that information has been sure, furnished. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Chairman, do I need to make a motion to that effect, or are we okay on that? Uh, well, I guess Is we could a motion just, just make a motion just to make sure. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we table the possible uh, taking of ownership of Frog Level, the former Frog Level Volunteer uh, Rescue Squad, until our next board meeting in November. Second. We knew the proper second that we would table the ownership of the Frog Level Volunteer Fire Department until our, our November meeting. All in favor, let it be known by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. That takes us to agenda item number 10, which is the first reading of uh, text amendment 0515, repeal and replace definition of rural, commercial, recreational use, dorm rooms. Okay, Mr. Finchel. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, it's back. Um, this is the Rural Commercial Recreational Amendment that the board uh, looked at uh, some months back and declined to uh, refer the amendment to the Planning Commission. Uh, subsequent to uh, the board's decision, uh, the applicant approached the Planning Commission, prepared some additional information for consideration uh, and requested the Planning Commission uh, to consider a text amendment, which the Commission did and has forwarded the recommendation to amend the definition of a rural commercial recreational facility uh, to allow uh, dormitory facilities. The amendment would not automatically allow such a facilities. Uh, an applicant would still have to come and go through the special exception permit process uh, and be reviewed uh, by the Planning Commission with the ultimate decision uh, by the Board of Supervisors. Um, 
With that, this is the proposed first reading of said text amendment. The uh, board can continue the first reading. Uh, it could go forward with a public hearing, um, or the board could could table the request. Okay. I guess the question I would have is, uh, the board members have questions or concerns about the definition. Uh, Mr. Thomas. Mr. Chairman, if I may, um, would uh, Mr. Fincham, I'm not sure you'd know this if Mrs. Carter left, but would dorm rooms, since they're probably going to be charged for, would they be part of the transit occupancy tax? Ms. Carter and I have discussed that, and we, we believe there may be a mechanism by which it would be subject to TOT. I think that issue needs to be vetted further. Uh, you will see that he's also potentially selling the site to a nonprofit. Right. So I, I think there are some issues there that, that warrant additional discussion. In theory, yes, dormitories um, Are part would qualify for TOT. Okay. Thank you, sir. Other questions? Uh, Mr. Mr. Fincher, um, has the uh, sports complex hooked up to our sewer system yet? No, sir. Have they, have they, I mean, we had talked about a number of things they were going to do, um, I believe. Is that correct? We had, My recollection is one of the first things they were directed to do was to secure their existing pump and haul facility. Yes. Which they, they have fenced off that area. So, um they, they address that issue. Um, I believe there was discussion generally about you have conditions, we have modified them before, comply with the conditions and we would consider the request. Uh, you will note in the supplemental material that um, the applicant has acknowledged that the construction of dormitory facilities would require the connection to the county sewer system. Uh, but again, th that provision is currently in the conditions that the board has placed on that property. Yes, right. sir. All right. Thank you, Mr. Fincham. Other questions? Yeah, Mr. Fincham. Fincham. Uh, is this the only rural commercial recreational use uh, zoning that we have in the county? Would this be the I believe place? there may be one more smaller one, Mr. Akers. This is the only one that I would believe, I believe if you amended the ordinance would qualify potentially for this amendment. Okay. Other questions? How does the board wish to address? We can, we can uh, table it. It can go for public hearing, right? So how does the board? Mr. Mr. Chairman. Oh, go ahead. I mean, as far as, the, as far as the text amendment is concerned, can we make it a requirement that the sewer has to be hooked up before this is approved? I believe you could make that a condition of the approval. Yes, sir. But I, I guess my question was, or, or is, I, make this. I, say make I, I thought that was a part of the condition anyway. That no. There's a condition now that speaks, that requires With the connection years. to public yeah. sewer. Right. Okay. So even if we, even if we did approve the request that they're asking, they, they have to have, if they have to be hooked up to, to the water and sewer before they can, before this would take effect anyway, is the way I understand it. They could, you could move that up and specifically condition as part of the special exception permit. 
that prior to the issuance of a certificate of occupancy that the facility be connected to public sewer. Okay. They don't get a CO that way until that is done. Which you already have that in the current conditions that requires them to connect to sewer which has not been done to date. The, and I believe in the justification they're telling you that financially up to that that this potential partnership would allow that connection to occur sooner I think that is part of their justification because we gave them if I'm not mistaken we gave them three years correct I'm back in the spring or whenever it was was L last year, was year last, I believe. Last year, yes sir it was three years yes sir So we're about year one of year three this would move that up and this would force them to connect because they couldn't get a certificate of occupancy until such time as as the sewer was connected if we made that condition correct in theory yes I would also suggest that there's a there is a potential out there what if the the a special as an example special exception permit is approved for a dormitory with a condition that says you have to connect to public sewer prior to the issuance of a certificate of occupancy but those dorms may not be constructed for four or five years you've actually then moved that connection further back potentially so we would need to be careful in crafting any modification to make sure it's two years or prior to the issuance of the sewer. Yes, whichever is yeah. there sooner. Yeah, we could do that. I think if you go forward, you want to preserve the fact that we're a year in two to three years that the board previously uh, uh, granted or approved with the amendment. You want to be careful not to lose that. May I, Mr. Chairman? Mr. Thomas? Um, and, I, and I'm not sure this is this is necessarily supposed to weigh in our decision, but but my opinion, and I believe that the owner is trying to sell this facility. Putting the dorms helps him sell the facility. So if we, that's just the, the landscape as I see it. So if we approve the dorms, that means we'll probably have a new owner who'll do more, but we still don't want to change the connection to the county sewer, which was a condition originally that he was 18 months behind. We came back and allowed him another three years, so now he's got two years to do that, less than two. So that's where we are. If he just walks away from the facility, we lose a little bit of revenue, a lot of revenue. So we need to help facilitate this sale. Yeah, there's, there's money we get from it. Other questions? But if you wish to table it, that's fine. If, if we tabled this tonight, we could go to public hearing any time with this. Is that not true? We've, we've, we've done a reading. We know what we have. Um, the applicant's not here. Is there anybody here for the applicant at all? Yes. No. I guess because this is multifaceted this is this is sewer connection taking a facility that you potentially have from what I understand and turning it into dorms and or building a separate dormitory which are, are two other completely different issues but I mean connecting to the sewer is the primary and I, I think when we talked I don't know if you were here then that was our primary objective was to get that off off of pump and hall because it's not it is not facilitating anything that needs to be done my understanding uh, from mr. Radbanny is that that the sewer yes is basically a prerequisite almost on his part also I mean the, the dormitories that he's talking about would be within the existing facility so it, it's not that I'm saying moving forward there wouldn't be you know request for additional uh, dormitories but it would be built within on the basketball or basketball court side of the uh, of the facility so uh, from what I read you know from his uh, 
from what he submitted that that's that's accepted. I mean, that's expected on his part, regardless of even the, uh, the remaining two years, or it would basically move that up, you know, that time frame up. And I guess what I'm looking for is the unencumbered connection to the sewer, because when I see what they want to do with this facility, you're going to have to have all of those facilities to occupy kids that you bring here, because they're not no, playing exactly. baseball yeah. 15 hours a day. I'm sorry? They're not playing baseball 15 hours a day. You're going to have to have the rest of that, you're going to need the facility that's there, this lack of dormitory, I mean, aside from dormitory, you can't, this is just me speaking, you know, you want to take half of the facility that's indoor and turn that into dormitories. And I'm saying if you have, if you have, you bring folks there to do baseball, they're going to do baseball three, four, five hours a day. What do you do with the other ten hours a day? Oh, no. No, I, well, I, I understand what you're saying, but we're not talking about. <laughs> and I'm the being realistic. And the moonshine too. <laughs> okay, all right. So at this point, we could say that we could add a condition that says the sewer hookup has to come prior to the dormitories. If we, that's what I hear the board saying. Or we could table it um, until our November meeting. And then I don't know what tabling it is going to do, really, because I don't know that we're going to have any more information in November than we have now. I mean, I don't know that uh, our, our, our views are going to change. It seems to hinge on the connecting to the sewer. That seems to be what the, the board is saying. Right. So, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, to, to, to clarify, uh, we, are, we are saying that if we allow dormitories, they would have to connect to the county sewer system right. on the earliest date, either when the dormitories are completed or when their original yeah. time period was, whichever those whichever came, first. whichever came first. So we really, we would be, as a, as a county, we would be at no risk because they would still be required to do it within the three-year time frame we would also get the benefit of if they did dormitories, we would get it sooner, and we would also have an opportunity for the transit occupancy tax, which would bring additional revenue to them now. So, you know, in Mr. Underwood's absence, I could make a motion that we move ahead to public hearing, or we could wait for Mr. Underwood to come back. Um, the reality is that this was in the Mattapanai district for most of its lifetime. It has only recently transferred to the Reedy Church district. So, Mr. Did you have another comment, Mr. 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 Chairman, the only point I was going to make is the only amendment is to change the definition to include dormitories. The discussion related to the connection to sewer would arise during a consideration of the special exception right. amendment to allow the dormitory. Okay. So all, all this deals with is the definition. Okay. There's no risk moving forward. A motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. It has been moved in proper second that we would uh, move forward with the uh, first reading as well as um, Public hearing. Public hearing. All in favor, let it be known by saying aye. Aye. All in for, all opposed. Motion yeah. carried. You better. You better. You better do a nay vote before you go. Motion carried. Okay, a roll call vote. Mr. Thomas, how do you vote? Aye. Mr. Black. Aye. Mr. Underwood is uh, not here. Mr. Akers. Hey. You vote nay. Mr. For the sake of public hearing, I'll vote aye. I'll vote aye. Motion carried. Mr. Underwood's returning, if you'd like to register his vote. Mr. Underwood votes nay. Mr. Underwood votes nay. So it's uh, four to two. Okay. Let's move ahead to agenda item number 11. First reading proposed text amendment. Article 13, Section 1-4, Off-Street Parking Requirements. 
Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, the proposed text amendment uh, that you have before you tonight uh, is necessary for the application for the Lady Smith Crossing rezoning application to proceed. Um, the current GDP um, was based upon a uh, roughly one parking space for every 200 square feet of retail area. Um, the proposal before you would amend that uh, to one space per 250 square feet. So it would actually reduce the overall parking requirements for um, a, a shopping center in the PSC zoning district. Our parking regulations, uh, for the most part, were based upon standards back from the early 70s. And one thing that we found over the years is that a lot of times those parking spaces go unused for probably 95 to 98 percent of the calendar year. The heaviest usage in the parking areas tends to be uh, during that time between Thanksgiving and Christmas. And otherwise, it's a sea of vacant parking. Um, so this proposed text amendment uh, is consistent with the uh, general development plan that has been submitted with the rezoning request uh, and is comparable to uh, the parking standards from uh, some of the other jurisdictions we have surveyed for, for these larger types of development. Okay. Questions, Mr. Seeley? Mr. Fincham, should we actually, in crafting this, I mean, if somebody built a 20-acre or, or has tw a smaller facility, are we then just allowing for less parking? Should we put a size in this over a certain size? Because I do agree with you, parking gets um, underused, but when you, at what point do you need more than you than we're going to have with this? Is there a, a, a point where a building size should be one per 200 and then a point where it should be one for 250? I think it really deals with use. And I'll give you an example. You would not want to reduce the parking requirements for a restaurant. Correct. Okay. This does not do that. Okay. This is simply re uh, uh, tied to uh, retail uh, floor area retail for the retail aspect does not cover um, you know convenience stores or restaurants or I things like that I didn't see the differentiation rental floor area to one per 250 for retail development we actually have a de if you want to say develop change development to business Okay. Or, I guess I'm not, I didn't use. understand what the difference was. Um, we actually have a <laughs> parking standard for retail sales. Okay. That's the one per 250. Okay. So if you want to change that last sentence uh, for retail, instead of say retail development, say retail sales, I think that goes to that specific classification that we're looking at. And, th and that's the only, I guess I didn't differentiate between the two, and I thought we were moving the whole thing. No, 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 just retail. Okay. So Can I we, think development's fine, but if, if you want to. I'm not a planner. I'm just reading this, and I read this as. Yeah. No, I, I think the restaurant is the perfect example of what you don't want to change. Correct. Okay. Yes, sir. That's not, that's not done, accomplished with this. Okay, as long as that's not accomplished, I'm okay. fine. Good. So. We need to send this to, to public hearing. We yes, this, this request is also pending at the uh, Planning Commission for approval. Once they forward the recommendation to you, uh, the appropriate action would be to advertise for public hearing at the next available board meeting. Okay. So then do we want to table it until uh, the Planning Commission makes their decision? or? Do we want to send it to public hearing prior, uh, 
when 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 it's approved or pending approval or pending approval from the planning commission yeah, we were just trying to keep this running with the expedited rezoning which is why okay. we have recommended this we can okay. so we can we can we can uh, advertise a public hearing yes regardless of what they say okay but i was just saying would it be appropriate to have to have a public hearing prior to planning commission approving it no you can't do that right the planning commission needs to make its recommendation to so, the board. so so we have to say uh pending approval from the planning commission well, not necessarily not approval. approval they could they could okay. recommend denial okay. as long as they take an action pending, oh, action. pending action from or, the or, or then or they have to not take action for like okay. 60 days 90 days and then okay so then the motion is in order so move mr chairman i second we would probably second that we would uh, send this to public hearing um, pending action from the Planning Commission. Hopefully for the first meeting in November. Well, I mean, pending action for the Planning Commission, basically. Okay. We can't do it before then. So. All in favor? They meet next week. You mean next week, the Planning Commission? They meet Thursday. Oh, this week. Okay, all in favor, let it be known by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Mr. Chairman, abstain. Motion carries. Uh, the records will show four uh, ayes and one abstention. Five, Five ayes and one abstention. Thank you. Okay, that takes us to discussion of adding Carlisle County Visitor Center yeah. to the list of county facilities made available for rental by the public. Mr. I oh, got it, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Mr. Black had uh, received a, a call from a, a local church that was interested in, in using the uh, visitor center for community outreach. It's included in your packet, and we realized we didn't really have any policy for use of that facility um, as a public facility, as this room in the EOC and uh, another uh, room down in the uh, other end of the building. You know, set policy. We rent them out. Um, we charge for it and, and that type of thing. Um, so we have it on uh, tonight to, to discuss. I mean, obviously, uh, we have a few things that you know, we feel are important. Uh, being that it's a visitor center, we don't think that you would be able to really rent that out during the day. It would be a conflict in there with the general public wandering in and out and whatever. Somebody's trying to have a birthday party. Um, and so uh, we think it would be in the off hours. Um, clearly, there needs to be somebody present as we have in this facility when we rent it out so there is a going to be a cost there's not it's not like whoever's here can suddenly be there if this is rented so we may end up having to, to put on some other part-time staff to be able to do it so my thoughts are maybe uh, as uh, as a trial period you, you pick you know hey we'll do it friday saturday night or friday saturday sunday night or, you know come up with a i don't know that you necessarily need it seven days a week yet um or, or, or a few not you know a tuesday night you know come up with something that uh that would would give some limited use of the facility in that area that would be beneficial not only to this church but some other folks that may may have a, a use of that uh, at night but um, i think if you want to have it all the time it's, it's going to certainly be a cost to, to provide could, that could we get staff to come up with a policy clearly um and bring that back and then we would decide on it at that time be glad to okay all right that's the consensus of the board. I don't think we need a motion for that. Okay, that takes us to informational calendar items. Um, get my next piece up. We have obviously been brought up. We have a fall festival in Bowling Green this weekend. Um, the uh, 21st, we have the regional elected officials meeting, and uh, Mr. Black is going to attend that. The 22nd, Mr. Akers, Community Meeting, Lady Smith Library. Uh, the key date, the 27th, we have the RACSB legislative get-together at their building over across from the, and you don't want to forget that. <laughs> you, you want to forget that. Um, Mr. Seeley has a community meeting on the 29th along with Mr. Akers. Um, and then Frog Level has their uh, Halloween festival, uh, Frog Level Day, uh, the 31st. The VACO annual conference starts on uh, the sixth and runs through the 10th uh veterans day the 11th county office is closed board meeting on the 12th so i've already moved us all way to the next board meeting okay. um and uh then we have a, a 
meeting on the 24th. I will uh, be in Florida, so Mr. Parton will be subbing for me. It's okay with the folks. <laughs> All right. That'll be, a, that'll be a long evening, Mr. Parton. You'll pile up the agenda. Everything I can possibly everything I don't want to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that takes us to closing board comments. Do you have any closing board comments? Uh, well, Mr. Chairman, this is probably our last board meeting. This is our last board meeting before the election, so I wish uh, everyone good luck. Thank you. Mr. Black? No, Mr. Chairman, not this time. Thank you. I wish you good luck, Mr. Black, in the election. <laughs> Unless it's a major write-in candidate. <laughs> Mr. Underwood. No, sir, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Akers. No, sir. No, Mr. sir, Mr. Stewart. Chairman. And I have none either. I would also like to wish all the board members good luck as well. Okay, that takes us to our closed meeting. Um, um, I Mr. Chairman, I move that the board convene in closed meeting pursuant to the personnel exemption section of 2.2-311A1 of the Code of Virginia to discuss a personnel matter involving a performance of a county employee. Okay, is there a second? Second. So we move to public second that we enter into closed meeting under section 2.2-3711A-1 personnel. All in favor, let it be known by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Good night.